Oh, when I first got the Holy Ghost, nobody told me really about intercessory prayer. But I do know one thing. One time I was praising God, and he said, if I, if I was fixing to come, would, is that how you'd be praising me? I'm Elissa, and you're listening to the Intentional Apostolic Podcast. So before we jump into today's podcast, I just want to let you guys know really quick that while I was recording this, my cats decided it would be a great time to do play fighting. So if you hear anything that sounds a little funky, that's probably what it is. Now, without further ado, let's jump into this podcast with my amazing Nana. One of the first things God taught me when I got the Holy Ghost, one time my husband worked for Rainbow and he sold 30 something vacuum cleaners, but he got paid for one. And he found out later that the boss paid him for one, but he sold 30. But anyway, we was on on the way home from church and he asked, well, before we left church, he asked his brother if he could give him $10 because we didn't have any food. And he told him, no, he didn't have $10. And then we drove home and everything. We got home and uh, he got his rainbow vacuum cleaner out and started defrosting the freezer. I asked him what he's doing. He said, getting ready for the food God's going to send us. I said, sure. He <laughs> said, go to the door and check if there's somebody there. So I went to the door. I opened up the curtain, opened the door, and there was nobody there. So I went back. He said, go to the door again. So I went. Back to the door, opened up the curtain, looked, and opened the door, and nobody there. I walked back there. There ain't nobody there. Go to the door, there's somebody there. So I stoked to the door. I didn't bother opening the curtain that time. I just slammed the door open, and here's the sister knocking on the door. And I screamed bloody murder, and she and I started crying. And she started crying, asked me what was wrong. She says, she lived 25 miles away, the opposite way from church from us. She lived in Maryland. We lived in Delaware. And she says the Lord told us to go over our house and take us to the store because we needed some food. Wow. Anyway, and then one time we lived in uh, Triangle, Virginia, which is uh, by the military base, uh, I think the Marine base south of D.C., and one of the first things that happened, he was witnessing this girl, uh, girl and uh, he told her about the Holy Ghost and everything. And so for her to believe that night, we had a thunderstorm and the lightning went down in between the apartments and the sky turned gray and everything. And our next oldest son had the Holy Ghost, had the Holy Ghost and he was in, the, in there in the hallway jumping up and down, dancing in the spirit, praying real good, and then she came over the next day. She ended up getting the Holy Ghost. Wow. And then we had another lady that had a little boy that the husband did abuse him, and we babysit the one night, and we was praying for her, and I tried to tell my husband something, and I couldn't tell him because I couldn't stop pe- speaking in tongues. And these are the same apartments. And then another time at 11 o'clock in the afternoon, we lived in the basement apartment. There was upstairs and then upstairs. And a lady called the police and said we were disturbing the peace. So the police came out at 11 o'clock in the afternoon and talked to us and everything. And then another time he was witnessing this other lady and she had held a ghost and she thought, uh, he thought, my husband and then were messing around, so he came down there. He had red hair, and when he came in, he was really furious. And I was sitting on the couch. My husband was sitting in the chair, and she was standing over the wall, against the wall there, back, back behind my husband. He came in and started scr- yelling and everything, and all of a sudden, in between my husband and that man, uh, there was a silhouette of the Holy Ghost. And I just sat there in just in awe because I've never seen anything like that that before. So that was a that was an awesome place to live. We didn't have, have any money or anything. We ended up moving because we had couldn't pay the rent, but we went back to Texas. But I know we should have stayed there. But anyway, and there was this other girl that we prayed through, and she said she wanted to go back to her yoga and stuff. And the last time I seen her, it looked like she had two donuts on her eyes, big old white donuts on, uh, like donuts. Well, not really a donuts, biscuits, like for you cook them. Is blinding her eyes. Wow. So, her choosing to go back to how she had been living her life, 
she chose to give up the clarity and salvation that she had had at one time. Yeah. That's kind of sad and scary. Okay, really quick while I'm thinking about it, on the last podcast, uh, you actually gave the wrong year for when you were born. When were you born? 1947. 1947. So how old are you now? 73. How long have you had the Holy Ghost? May the 1st will make 47 years. Wow. So you, so three years from now, you'll have had the Holy Ghost for 50 years. No, 47. No, you said 40s. Yeah, I, uh, May the 1st will make 47 years I've had yeah, the Holy Ghost. so three years from now, you'll have had it 50 years. Yeah. Wow, that's a long time. I was about 25. Wow. Making me feel really, really young. Sometimes I feel old, but this makes me feel young. So I have a few questions that people on Instagram wanted me to ask you. Um, so there's a girl named Mail, I believe it is. And she wants to know, what was your biggest challenge in your walk with God? Fear. Fear. And when I first got the Holy Ghost, I went around all the time quoting uh, perfect love casts out all fear because before I got the Holy Ghost and after I got the Holy Ghost, we saw, saw spirits almost constantly. Do you think that contributed to you living in a state of fear? Yeah, when you see uh, shadows and you have stuff that's like a snake crawling over you and stuff like that, yeah. Do you think that was the only contributing factor or just the main one? The main one. Okay, so next question. Safi wants to know, how did you realize that the apostolic truth is the truth? Okay. When God first started dealing with us, we lived in California. I said that the first time. Then this not the second house, but the third house we lived in. We got some mail about the Holy Ghost, some speaking in tongues, and my husband didn't pay any attention to it. We also, when we went to that deal out of Expo 71, these ladies gave him an Acts 238 track, and he didn't pay any attention to them because they, they wouldn't let him, had a circle around him, and wouldn't let him out to get his Bible, so he didn't listen to them. So uh, then when we moved to Delaware, the lady that came over to talk to me the night I got to deliver cigarettes, they were talking about only being one God and the Holy Ghost, and we started going to a, a Jesus name apostolic church then, and then we started going to the one in Dover, because every time we passed by the one in Dover, I just felt this drawing, like, why aren't we going there? So, side question, have you ever struggled with the doctrine of the Trinity or, like, ever believed in that? I grew up, I went to a Catholic church, but I didn't officially grow up in one, and I didn't, couldn't understand what they're saying because I was always in Latin. And so, no, I didn't, I didn't struggle with the night I got delivered of cigarettes. I, I said, if that's true, I accept it, and God just showed it to me. So, no, I've never struck, really struggled with it. Okay. So can you tell me a little bit about, like, growing up around or in the Catholic Church? I just remember going to the church and, uh... What was it like? Like going in the mortuary. <laughs> so it was like going to a funeral home? Yeah, it's like a funeral home. And then when I was uh, in the sixth grade of, I think, I was 12 or 13, me and my sister skipped school for six weeks. And my mother put us in this cafe at home. And she had to go with the big girls, and I had to go with the little ones. And the nuns were really mean. I had this friend that was a Baptist, and because she didn't get up and go to Mass that early in that morning, they beat her. And they made us scrub the floor on our hands and knees, and it just turned me against it because they were so mean. When you say beat, what was that like? I wasn't, didn't see it. I just know they beat her. I remember you mentioning when I was younger that the nuns would make you hold 
all your fingers like together pointed straight up and then they'd hit it, the ends of them with a ruler. They did that to my sisters when I went to a Catholic school for a punishment. Did they ever do that to you? No, I didn't get to go to Catholic school. <laughs> God protected me because you're put to know all these prayers where you can start making your first Holy Communion and I knew them all. But I went, out, went up to the priest to say them all. I forgot all of them. So God allowed me not to go to school, and he allowed me not to, to make the first communion thing. He protected me. Do you think your life would have been a lot different if you had ended up going to the Catholic school and like being indoctrinated? Probably. Do you think it would have been harder for you to accept the truth and like make that shift? Probably. Okay. So next question um, what are the best tips you have for young people? The best tip? Yeah, like, if you were talking to a young person and they were asking, like, what you would suggest or, like, what the biggest thing you would encourage them to do to strengthen their walk with God, like, what advice would you give them? Pray every day. Read your word. And if you have a, like, perfect love cast out of fear, you're having a problem, close the scripture back at the devil. And plead the blood of Jesus upon you and your family every day. That's good advice. All right, so this is a question for me since I know you. But your prayer life, um, what exactly, when it comes to prayer, you are something. What is that? An intercessor. And what does that look like? What's it look like? Yeah, what's that like? Well, the first time I, well, not the first time, lots of the first times when I started praying, it felt like I was having a baby because I, I found out later I was travailing. And the Bible talks about travailing. Yeah. And it, it literally feels like you're having a baby. In the long term, what's that like? So you mentioned that it was like having a baby when you first started out. What's it like now? Well, when you start travailing and you get the, I don't want to use the word victory. You get the, uh, I guess, victory. You come to a point where it, it, it lifts, and all of a sudden you, uh, you dance in the spirit. Is every time you enter into that mode of intercessory prayer, is it always exactly the same? No. So what would be some uh, examples of variations? Uh, some people make different sounds in their things. Some people moan and groan and make strange sounds that people make fun of you. But God, uh, a brother in the Lord says, all intercessories pray different. But if you're really in deep prayer for somebody for intercessory, it does feel like you're having a baby and it hurts in the pit of your stomach because that's where your soul's at. Because when you get butterflies, it's in the pit of your stomach. If you... God tells you sometimes there's something wrong and you feel it in the pit of your stomach. So what some people would call like that sixth sense or like innate knowledge, that's your soul and that's the prompting of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. He tells you stuff and he also lets you know when there's something around you, you just, you just sense it's not feel, feel right. Okay. So I know some people struggle with hearing the voice of God or being able to differentiate what's like the leading of the Holy Ghost and what's just, you know, random thoughts in their mind. What would you suggest on being able to tell the difference? How do you know? Well, he'd never tell you to do anything that's against the word of God to start off with. That's true. And he tells you in different ways. Sometimes he tells you in the words, sometimes in the dreams, sometimes in the vision, sometimes in your mind. Sometimes somebody will walk up and say something to you, and uh, sometimes all of it, all of it, like. Yeah. Okay, so when, when you have an interaction where it's like a thought in your mind or somebody comes and tells you something, how do you know whether that's God or that's you or that's the enemy? Because those are the three different sources that we can get something from. You don't always know. You have to... You have to pray about it and ask God because a lot of times some people will listen to you 
or listen to you and or and won't listen to somebody else or something, then they just take one side of the story. Always take both sides of the story before you judge. Even if you like like the other person you want to believe them first, they might be telling the one side of the lie. So always hear both sides of the story. Do you think that developing a prayer life and like talking to God regularly helps strengthen discernment where you know on this type of stuff? Oh, yes. Okay. So, if you were to suggest just one thing that the younger generation, like my generation, then a generation that's right under me, if you would suggest just one thing that, like, we could change or improve on, what would it be? The way you worship. Worship him in truth. Because uh, a lot of people hi- are worshiping and hype. When you're really worshiping him, it's, it comes from, from inside of you. You can just feel it. It just comes from inside of you. It's different when you're really worshiping from your heart. Just like when you're praying. Kind of sometimes it feels like uh, you're travailing so hard and everything. It's like somebody just died or something. You just you can't control yourself. You just keep praying. Do you think that some people, when they get in the spirit, that their human emotions will shift to match whatever's going on in the spirit? Where, like, someone starts getting in the Holy Ghost and trafficking in the deep, and they might have been perfectly happy before hitting that, but when they get in in the deep, there's a spirit of sorrow or a spirit of urgency or something else that the Holy Ghost is communicating and that we're we our human emotions shift to fit whatever the holy ghost yes. is promi- okay. prompting on us yes so next question i know that some people are afraid of the supernatural or at least skeptical and questioning when it comes to that sort of stuff What suggestion would you give to a young person, especially, that maybe they want to start, you know, experiencing those supernatural and deep things in the Holy Ghost, and they don't necessarily have somebody around them to show them, or, you know, they haven't had an opportunity to experience that? What suggestion would you give for that? Oh, when I first got the Holy Ghost, nobody told me really about intercessory prayer. But I do know one thing. One time I was praising God, and he said, if I, if I was fixing to come, would, is that how you'd be praising me? So I really started putting myself into it and started praising him. So do you think that being sincere is a key to the supernatural? Yes, and not being afraid of it, because most people are. I am to a certain extent on, like, the gifts of tongues interpretation, but... Most of the church nowadays is lived in the hype for so long, they are scared of the supernatural. Okay, so you've mentioned that a couple times. What's the difference between hype and actual worship? Okay, when you see a bunch of people jumping up and down, and they keep jumping up and down, and none of them are getting the spirit, that's hype. Or they get all excited and uh, they start jumping up and down where the preacher's going on and hollering and everything. You you can't hear what's going on. You can't hear the preaching. And that's that's hype. Because back when I first got in church, if you really jumped for joy, the next thing that person would be dancing in the spirit or something. But nowadays, they just it's in the flesh. There's a few people getting the spirit, but not that many. And they don't know what they're missing. Yeah. So... What do you think that key is from transitioning of just acting in the flesh to entering into the spirit? Just start really worshiping and don't care what people think about you. If they laugh at you, because I've been laughed at, they laugh at you. You just don't. Well, you don't know what you don't. You don't have to tell them. Just think. Well, they don't know what they're missing and pray for them. So you think the key to switching over from being in the flesh to being in the spirit is you focusing on God and God alone 
and basically blocking out and not paying attention to other people and other people's opinions. Yeah. You just got to trust God and go on with God. Mm. So one last question. Do you have any parting words or anything you'd like to share for this episode for the young people that listen to this? Just uh, keep serving God because things are fixing to get worse. And if you're not full of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to make it. And don't let nobody deceive you. It's got to be in the Word and backed up by the Word. And don't let people sweet talk you because that is one of the things that I can't stand. There's a lot of people in church that manipulate other people by sweet talking them into doing stuff that they know they shouldn't be doing. Don't let them do, do that to you. All right, guys, you heard it here. Stick to the word in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every single word be established. Don't be in the flesh. Be in the spirit. Focus on God. And we will catch you next time.